Because now it's recording. Okay. <laughs> A little technical problem there. Okay. So, welcome to the 150th anniversary of uh, Thaddeus Stevens' death. Uh, the thing, putting this together, I'm amazed that this hasn't been done before. Like for the 50th anniversary and the 100th anniversary. In fact, I'm kind of amazed that we don't have a huge Thaddeus Stevens Society complex with with millions of dollars in our treasury and such like that. That they had to wait around until 1999 for me to get around to starting the Thaddeus Stevens Society. Uh, instead of commemorating such an important person as Thaddeus Stevens, over those 150 years, we've seen the proliferation of statues to the uh, to the racist traitors that were on the other side, which is kind of amazing. And it's, it isn't completely amazing because the, I would say, neo-Confederates, the original Confederates, were very determined during their time to push their position. In fact, Thaddeus Stevens uh, recognized this in his time, and he made a comment in the 1850s when they were battling over the Compromise of 1850 about, about the dedication of the South to slavery and oppression. And he said, it is not my purpose nowhere in these remarks to make personal reproaches. I entertain no ill will towards any human being nor any brute that I know of not even the skunk across the way to which I referred to earlier. <laughs> Least of all would I reproach the South. I honor her courage and fidelity. Even in a bad, a wicked cause, she shows a united front. All her sons are faithful to the cause of human bondage because it is their cause. But the North the poor, timid, mercenary, driveling North has no such united defenders of her cause. Although it is a cause of human liberty, none of the bright lights of the nation shine upon her section. Even her own great men have turned her accusers. She is liberty. She is the victim of low ambition, an ambition which prefers self to country personal aggrandizement to the high cause of human liberty. She is offered up as a sacrifice to satisfy Southern tyranny, to conciliate Southern treason. And that was in 1850. Now, you'll also say, well, why hasn't there been things about Thaddeus Stevens in the last 150 years? Well, this is interesting. This is a book written in 1967 the dark old ages, <laughs> what I happen to be living. And uh, it's written by Milton Metzer, who did a biography of Thaddeus Stevens called Thaddeus Stevens and the Fight for Negro Rights. And I thought it would be interesting to read this at the beginning here today about the change. Wicked, wretched, evil, hard, malignant, vindictive, domineering, revengeful, Unforgiving, implacable, cunning, mad. Thaddeus Stevens has been called all these names and more. He can, he can lay claim to being one of the best hated men in our past. One historian has said Stevens was, quote, perhaps the most despicable, malevolent, and morally deformed character who has ever risen to high power in America. The harsh judgments his enemies made in his lifetime still echo in the textbook students use now, 1967. Hopefully they've changed. What did this man do to deserve this? He fought to establish free public schools. He defended fugitive slaves in the courts. He championed the right of free speech for dissenters. He spoke up for unpopular minorities, Indians, Mormons, Jews, Negroes. He led the political struggle to free the slaves and to protect their rights through the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. 
and he tried to reconcile the defeated South on a foundation of justice for all and a democracy of true equality. I have this, I actually ought to use this. If this is what he stood for, and I ought to turn it on. If this is what he stood for, why do so many Americans detest him? Why, for that matter, is Robert E. Lee, who led armies in a bloody war to preserve slavery, called a saint? Well, Thaddeus Stevens, who warned against slavery, is called a devil. Hopefully things are changing. Now, now a lot of people, I have a hard time telling him, telling them exactly why Thaddeus Stevens is important. And sometimes I use kind of a shorthand that I call him the 17th and a half president of the United States because he led a veto-proof Congress against Andrew Johnson. And he also was instrumental in the passage of the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. Even though he had died before the 15th Amendment was passed, he laid the groundwork for that. Now, to give you an idea of why he is so important, I would like you to imagine a society where he didn't live and the uh, things that he championed were not uh, passed. What you would have is you would have a Bill of Rights that is a dead letter in the states. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of uh, reproductive rights, all those would depend on how conservative your particular state was. Your state could decide, well, we're not gonna allow anybody to have birth control. Or they could decide that you have to be a particular religion. Also, they could actually, and this is kind of amazing, they could pass laws that would have different laws for different people. Just as the South, right after the Civil War, passed laws that only applied to African Americans and not to whites, called the Black Codes. Now, we are seeing now that the tide is turning as far as recognition for people like Thaddeus Stevens and for people like Robert E. Lee. You're seeing the statues come down, you're seeing statues go up, and in fact, right now, I am really happy to announce today that we have reached the goal of $60,000 in pledges for a statue of Thaddeus Stevens in Gettysburg. Now we have to find a sculptor and we have to find a location. But we want to make sure we got we had the money before we started those things. And I also want to make a special thank you to Michael Charney, who is not here, but he has contributed uh, $39,500 towards the statue. The rest have been raised through, uh, through many uh, pledges of people who will be hearing from us uh, in about a half a year to collect those pledges. Um, so in any case, uh, we are, as I said, we are seeing a turn in the uh, uh, recognition of people like Thaddeus Stevens. Uh, I would like to say that uh, to thank the Lancaster paper who did a super job of uh, having articles uh, yesterday about yeah. Thaddeus Stevens. Yeah. Probably, probably most of the people here are because of that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, however, we have a ways to go. And I just wanted to mention this one thing. Uh, in the last week, I saw on CBS News uh, two reports, actually they re-ran it, uh, about Franklin. Did anybody else see that on CBS about Franklin? Okay. It wasn't Benjamin Franklin. It was about the 50th year, 50th anniversary of the introduction of the black child Franklin in the Peanuts cartoons. Okay. And that got, like I said, two times in CBS News. Plus it was on The Daily Show. Guess who they didn't mention? <laughs> No mention of Thaddeus Stevens, and we did send a press release to CBS. You know, we didn't get any response from them, but um, 
In any case, in closing, in my uh, in in my introduction, I would like to say that Thaddeus Stevens should be an inspiration to all people, and we should be eternally grateful that he lived in triumph. Mm -hmm. Now we'd like to have uh, Paul Machete with it. introduce Paul Machete with a musical interlude, which actually should have been first, but I didn't remember. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Didn't remember. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, that was great. Let's hear it for Ross. <laughs> I'm Paul Christopher Machete, a resident of Lancaster County many years. I live in Gettysburg now, amateur historian, and I'm also a singer, songwriter most of my life. I was asked to write a song for Thaddeus Stevens, and it took me a long time to write a song for Thaddeus Stevens. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Because Thaddeus use Stevens the mic. accomplished use the mic. so use much the and had such a big life I think for so long. Because Thaddeus Stevens had such a big life and did so many things, it was hard to write a song. So I wrote this, The Ballad of Thaddeus Stevens. You want me to hold it for you? No. Men of iron, men of steel, helped to turn the wheel at the ironworks that he owned just west of Dow. It helped the times and eased the fears of all the mothers who had tears by bringing heat to every schoolroom then around. He'd been in Gettysburg for years, speaking wisdom and easing fears, doing good things for many people in the town. Just a common man, they say, he proved it every day, leaving no legacy in the future, men would say. They'd say Thaddeus believed that learning was the answer to people's troubles, and he knew. If you could educate and solve folks' need for learning, it would help fulfill their dreams and their yearnings. Club foot and hope and a staggering life of work gave Thaddeus his ability to propel. And as he began to gain through a lifetime of pain, being called the devil's child misunderstood. But you see, he'd really do his part by following his heart in that capital city we call Washington. He pushed through the laws that set men free but did anyone ever see it was Thaddeus who would illuminate our minds? So when I look around today, I understand why people say it was Stevens who would help the common man. I see a classroom or a school, they further mankind evermore. I see Thaddeus Stevens smiling at the door. You see, Thaddeus believed that learning was the answer to people's troubles, and he knew if you could educate, solve folks' need for learning, it would help fulfill their dreams and their yearnings. Men of iron, men of steel, helped to turn the wheel at the ironworks that he owned just west of town. All you have to do is go to Google, put in Ballad of Thaddeus Stevens, click on the picture of Secretary Stanton, and it'll play for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, now I'd like, I'd like to recognize Randy Harris for the dedication of a, a new sign for Thaddeus Stevens here in the uh, cemetery. And then, you want to call everybody migrate over there? Thank you, Ross. Can you hear me all? Yes. Um, want to make sure everybody uh, is thanked, not the least of which are all of you. Uh, Ross probably didn't mention, but every anniversary of Fatty Stevens' birth, April 4th, there's a commemorative celebration here with uh, Fatty Stevens College of Technology representatives, 
and we have never had this many people at an event like this. So it's really, really wonderful, heartwarming to see everybody here to recognize this guy, as Ross is saying, so long overdue. Um, I'm a volunteer. I, I live around the corner and was involved with a number of people with the new commemorative marker over here, which we'll see and unveil in a minute. Um, but this particular place is such a, and this particular day is such a wonderful commemorative occasion, appropriate. Um, and it, and in, again, in this particular spot where Mr. Stevens chose to be buried is really, really important. And we'll hear that, see that played out in the cemetery uh, marker here. So, you know, people here forever, future, will see that marker and understand a better idea why he was buried here and also in this particular plot. Um, have to acknowledge some people that helped out with this in remarkable ways. Uh, funding from the Association for a Study of African American Life and History uh, and the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Program, a, a program of the National Park Service. Under this program, we are dedicating over the next several weeks, maybe a month, three other historical markers that, that are recognized by the National Park Service as having an authentic connection to the Underground Railroad through valid, uh, positive research all around downtown. Um, we want to thank uh, Tom Ryan and Robin Surratt from LancasterHistory.org who applied for the grant, a matching grant from the National Park Service, and their organization added funds to this along with many other generous donations from the African American Historical Society, which I have the pleasure of being the archivist of, uh, Leroy Hopkins is the president. I'm not sure if Leroy is here, but wish him well. They helped out a great deal. Um, State Representative Michael Sterla. Greg Paulson is here representing Representative Sterla, who contributed to this. <laughs> Santa Concord Cemetery Foundation. Chris, Mess Chris Metzler there from Daddy Stevens College of Technology is the current board president that is the manager of this essentially abandoned piece of property that we could all use some more help from all of you good folk over the years ahead to help maintain and care for this place because it's it's up to this community because it's, it's you know the story it's an abandoned piece of property um, we also want to thank uh, Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology as I said Tim Neeson of Millersville helped us establish the research as to why Stevens chose to be buried here which is in, uh, installed on the marker there I don't know if Tim is here or not but uh, he should be um, and Ross Hetrick and George Mushoff, uh, this character, literally this character right here, did some great fact checking and, and some help out with the with the background on the market. What's the problem? Um, let's see, who else? Uh, we then took the basic uh, outline, the, the pictures that you may have seen before, and the text, why this guy is so important, and put it together. And Sharon Shuddy from her own graphic design firm over here, she put it all together into the beautiful form that you see it over there today. And uh, Bob and Justin Suford from North End Renovating of Lancaster did a great advice and jobs of installing that marker over there. So I think that's about everybody. One point I can just finish up here. Looking back, one year anniversary of Charlottesville and all of the tumult and all the anger and the tragedy that happened there over this whole issue of memorials, statues that we talk about and we're seeing in the Civil War era. This focus is like kismet beyond belief if you can pull that all together. Um, so 150 years from now, what about this marker? What will people look on back and see on this marker? I have to believe, I have to predict that because it's about truth, human freedom, justice, liberty, equality, there should be no divisiveness <coughs> and anger or looking back in, in second guessing hindsight to why we placed the marker here. Those basic fundamental freedoms are what will pull us all together as we go ahead. And this will be a guidepost, hopefully to future generations where they understand this man. So we're gonna pull the old marker off. You can sort of move a little bit over there, and then you can move back. Jeff. 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 While people are uh, looking at the uh, marker over there, I'd like to recognize Don Gallagher, who has been faithfully trying to get us a commemorative stamp uh, for Thaddeus Stevens. You want to come up here and say a couple words, Don? <laughs> Thank you, Ross. 
for more than 15 years, a number of us have been trying to urge the Postal Service. A number of us have been urging the Postal Service to issue a stamp honoring Thaddeus Stevens. The way you do that is to mail things to them in the mail to a committee that makes those decisions. That's what these postcards are for. I'll be passing them out, and please send them in. It'll make a big difference. They will. They'll be reconsidering a stamp for Thaddeus Stevens next April. So between now and then, if we make a big effort, we should be able to succeed this time. Thank you all. I better get one later. Thank you. I already did it. Okay, I, like everybody, so sir, come on back. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So we're going to resume our program here. The next thing we're going to be doing is reciting eulogies that were made in Congress in 1869 about Thaddeus Stevens. And amazingly enough, Amazon has republished these, and we have some over on our table. Let me see if there's still any more left. Uh, we sold them all out. <laughs> we only had five copies, but they were pretty popular. Anyway, these are people who knew Thaddeus Stevens, and George has to come over here. George! I don't answer to that. Thaddeus, come on over here, Thaddeus. I guess he's getting his uh, selfies. Yes. Can you ask we have, her to We have to wait away? a little bit. No. Can you the woman in the blue <laughs> and white, can you ask her? Can you move? Oh, she moved. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I'm the camera warden. <laughs> You're very official. I can't do this by myself, or otherwise I would. <laughs> Unexpected delays. We'll call your attention, sir. We'll call your attention. What caught my attention? To this well, I'm a history buff from way back. You know, uh, in fact, I got an award for having the highest grade uh, point average in high school uh, for history, and uh, I studied the uh, Civil War quite a bit, and uh, it. To me, this man epitomizes the core value of the United States, States, which is that all men are created equal, much more so than Thomas Jefferson, who mouthed it, but actually owned people. So Thaddeus Stevens not only talked about it, believed it, but lived it to his core. And that's why he's buried here, because this was the only integrated cemetery in Lancaster at the time of his death. So we got that here now. Thank you. You got, you got, you got your... Uh, Okay, so you begin. And these are eulogies from con congressmen who knew Thaddeus Stevens. <laughs> these were written by a number of, of my contemporaries in the Congress. This one from Congressman Dickey. Mr. Stevens was deeply loved and fully trusted by his constituents. He was often in advance of their views Sometimes he ran counter to their prejudices or passions, yet such was his popularity with them. It was so strong, their faith in his wisdom, in the integrity of his action, and purity of his purpose, that they never failed to sustain him. Popular with men of all parties, with his own supporters, his name was a household word. To them, and among themselves, old Thad, was a phrase of endearment, while even his foes spoke of him with pride as the great commoner. No man ever died more deeply mourned by a constituency than Thaddeus Stevens. Congressman Kuntz, his memory will be fondly cherished by that large body of people so recently liberated from human slavery. An early opponent of that institution, he battled against it with all the power of his gigantic intellect until the last shackle of the last slave was broken. And this day he is revered by them, 
next only to the immortal Lincoln. His name is a household word in the humble cabins of four million people whom he has helped up from the degrading conditions of bondage into the blessed light of freedom and will be inseparably linked with the great act of national justice by which the emancipation of a race from servitude was achieved. Congressman Ashley, can you all hear? Yeah. In espousing the cause of the slaves, more than 40 years ago, Mr. Stevens voluntarily accepted social and political rejection and patiently endured the persecutions of ignorant and maddened men for whose highest good he was laboring. He did this without fee or hope of political reward simply because he believed it to be right. And because he was right, we shall someday see the children of the men who stoned him gladly join hands with the liberated slave in bringing back the stones in the shape of blocks of whitest marble with which to build his monument. And as you can see, they brightened up the marble here. So <laughs> maybe that prophecy has come about. Congressman Maynard. He has left his impression upon the form and body of the times. Monuments will be raised, not too many though, to perpetuate his name on earth. Art will be busy with his chisel and her pencil to preserve the features and the image of his mortal frame. All will be done that brass and marble and painted canvas admit of being done. The records of his official acts will remain in your archives. Our chosen words of commemoration will fall into the channels of literature. But the influence of a gifted mind and molding thought and giving direction to events is not to be measured by words of commemoration or by official records. It is as measureless as the soul and enduring as time. Long after the brass and marble and painted canvases have disappeared, it will still remain transmitted from age to age and successive generations. Congressman Moorhead, he was a bold and daring leader Always in advance of public opinion, he constantly antagonized it with a valor and boldness unequaled. Usually, political leaders ascertain the current drift of public sentiment and accommodate themselves to it. Not so with Stevens. He formed his own opinions and acted on his own convictions. Opposition so far from weakening his resolve, only nerved him for whatever effort was necessary to the accomplishment of his purpose. He created public opinion and molded public sentiment. In this, above all other traits, lay the greatness of Thaddeus Stevens. Congressman Sapphire. Step by step, he fought his way up, dragging the nation after him, <laughs> until he attained, by the aid of many able and brave associates in Congress, the organization and establishment of governments in the rebellious states upon the basis of loyal citizenship and perfect equality of rights. Uh, as an aside, it didn't last, unfortunately. In his final labors of his life, when victory dawned upon the nation, the heroic old man died at his post, beckoning the people forward to higher and nobler achievements. Never will the services of this great man be duly appreciated by those in the defense of whose rights he has so manfully struggled. His name, with that of Lincoln, 
will ever be remembered with the warmest emotions of gratitude by this and succeeding generations of the emancipated people of America. When others now esteemed great shall have been forgotten, he needs no statue of bronze, no pillar of marble with carved inscriptions to tell posterity his fame. The labors and achievements of his life have rendered him immortal. Congressman, Congressman Poland, he loved freedom and liberty for himself and for all men as well. He hated every form of tyranny and oppression which clogged and opposed the advancement of men to better conditions. And especially did he abhor and detest that vast oppression which once prevailed in this country and which seemed likely to prevail forever, human slavery. Accordingly, when that institution came to be one of the subjects of political controversy, he was found among its most determined and advanced opponents. It is not saying more than I believe to be just to him that to his efforts as much as those of any one man is the country indebted for the final overthrow of slavery. When the country had become involved in a civil war of appalling magnitude upon the question of slavery, and the great question of the time was whether the Union or slavery should go down, Mr. Stevens seemed to rise at once to the magnitude and the majesty of the occasion. This is the last eulogy but you're gonna have to take a little course before I say it. <laughs> How many people here are familiar with Gulliver's Travels? Oh, that's good, we got a very educated uh, group here. You may remember there's a part where he pulls all the ships of the Lilliputians out to the sea, you know, as they attack him with little arrows. So I'm just telling you that so you're ready for the reference. Behind his remarkable brain power here lay a willpower which was rarely been equal among the sons of men, an intensity of purpose which no obstacle could arrest, no defeat daunt, and a determination of character which brightened with every encounter and rose freshened from every overthrow. Nothing could stand in the path of his purpose. That grim face never turned aside to catch the fickle murmur of popular applause. Public opinion had no terror from him. It should be written over his tomb that he never played the demagogue. He never stepped down to the lower plane of popular error. But at all times and on all occasions, he dared to do right, looking heaven in the face and fearing no man. He never flattered the people. He never attempted to deceive them. He never ever spoke to them in double sense. He never courted and encouraged their errors. On the contrary, on all occasions, he attacked their sins, he assailed their prejudices, he outraged their bigotries, and when they turned upon him and attacked him, he marched straight forward like Gulliver, walking through the fleets of the Lilliputians, dragging his enemies after him into the great harbor of truth. <laughs> So I see we're, we're pretty much ahead of the schedule, and uh, one of the nice things about uh, being ahead of the Thaddeus Stevens Society is talking to pe people who are very dedicated to Thaddeus Stevens, and one of the main goals I have here is to have fun, and uh, I, I seem to have accomplished that. Uh, is Janet Landon here? Well, anyway, I got an email from 
one of our uh, supporters, Janet Landon, who uh, said that uh, she was impressed by my jolly, uh, good, fun attitude towards everything. And I was thinking, maybe since we have a little bit of time, and I, I don't want to get this stretched out too long, uh, is there anybody else who would like to say anything about Thaddeus Stevens at this time? Yes. My name's Bob Holscher. Over 50 years ago, I wrote my senior thesis at Penn State on Thaddeus Stevens as a Lancaster politician. Um, I took the manuscript and I sent it to the Historical Society. And to my astonishment, two months later I got galleys for the publication of the paper in the Historical Society Journal. Most of the work I did was with Lancaster newspapers of the period. And after Stevens died 50 years ago today, there was a funeral held here in Lancaster. And the Lancaster Intelligencer, in its next issue, had a comment. Now, what I'm going to quote is not verbatim, uh, but it's pretty close that numbers of decent Republicans were revolted by the funeral observance of Mr. Stevens, we know all were prepared to set aside partisan differences and join in the obsequies. But everyone's expression turned into natural disgust when they saw the radical councilman of Washington, D.C. and their Negro clerk walking down the street arm in arm. <laughs> the people of Lancaster had heard about Mr. Stevens' advocacy of equality for years, but they were not prepared to see this manifestation of it. That's the end of what is not a verbatim quote. <laughs> but the Lancaster Newspapers Inc. Library has that issue of the intelligence if you would like to read it. Those sentiments, unfortunately, are still present today. And the fight is not done. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it was. Yes, go ahead. Somebody said something about fun. <laughs> I approve. <laughs> so, does so anyone else have uh, some short comments to make? Okay. Oh, yes, sir. This is very short. Okay, that's great. I just want to say that. Uh, my name is Bob Ibold. Oh, okay. My name is Bob Ibold. I live just a couple of blocks up in that direction. And I was raised in the segregated South. Yes, I am that old. <laughs> and when I moved to Lancaster about 50 years ago, I did not know who uh, Thaddeus Stevens was. That's because it, Thaddeus Stevens had been eliminated from all of our textbooks. And that was even true in my first year of college down there. So we moved here, and I wondered who he was. Then I figured out he was a local congressman. And then, this is the end, I came down here by accident and read what is on his tomb. And um, I cried. Mm -hmm. into our next thing. Ross, uh, another comment over here? Oh, okay. Hold on. There you go. Uh, just as a matter of historical balance, uh, I'm Ernie Schreiber. I was editor of the Lancaster New Era. And as you know, uh, always a Republican paper and Democratic paper. Uh, back in the, the 
times where, where we were reading about with the Intelligencer Journal, uh, it was a democratic paper and, and, and it was very racist and just read the papers. <laughs> but, the, but the examiner uh, and, the, the, and the, the paper which is quoted there were very positive. Lancastrians, in fact, always supported uh, Thaddeus Stevens. He, he won by landslides. And, and nationally, he had the same sort of audience. I had in my office behind my desk the wake for Thaddeus Stevens. When, when he was dying after essentially being president of the United States for, for several months, the streets were filled. There were blocks filled with, with ordinary people worried about, you know, wanting to know how Thaddeus Stevens was doing. He was beloved by the people of America, especially in North. He was beloved by the people of Lancaster County. And you have to discount, you know, the, the political times that led to the kind of bigotry that was in the intelligence of journal. <laughs> I think we have to sort of look on them as uh, intelligence or journal was sort of the fox of their day. Uh, I guess you have something that you, oh, I thought you wanted to say something. Yeah. Okay, sure. I mentioned the fox the other day. My name is Jonathan Fox. I worked 10 years for the county human relations commission until they were disbanded by two Republican County Commissioners. I want to make sure that you all know that the city of Lancaster's Human Relations Commission is alive and well, and as their investigator, I encourage you to spread that word so that we can continue to enforce the ordinance within the city that protects people from illegal discrimination in not only the usual ones, but also sexual orientation. So please continue to spread that word. The City of Lancaster's Human Relations Commission awaits hearing from people who need our assistance or support. So thank you. I don't want to take these gentlemen. I'm from Massachusetts, but I'm here for a reason in Lancaster, and it's because of people like you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there somebody else over here that's making some motion? Well, thank you. Yes. Yes, my name is Larry Ashby. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, as you know, had a disease and he didn't have no hair. But this good gentleman, Mr. Steven, does have hair. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, hold on. Hi, folks. I'm an alumni from Stevens 40 years ago. Um, I grew up poor in Elizabethtown. Had the opportunity to go to different Division II schools. My father was a historic artist, and he promoted Stevens as I was growing up. And it um, paid a lot of dividends. On my working vehicle, I had profiles of Stevens, um, and I use that as an advertisement tool as well. So. Great. OK, if we could have Paul up here. One more. OK, one more. One more. My name's Jack Dibble, and I just wanted to remember Thaddeus Stevens for what he did for the people of the Commonwealth in the public schools. In 1835, he helped pass the Free School Act. A year later, people from Lancaster County, but not from anyone that we know, attempted to have it repealed. And in a thunderstorm, he rode to, to Harrisburg and gave a speech that turned the tide. And that is one of the reasons we have free public schools in Pennsylvania, something that has touched probably almost everyone in this group. Certainly accomplished quite a bit. So, any more out there? Okay, well, if we can have Paul right back there, he's going to be giving us a little musical accompaniment. And now we'll hear from Mr. Stevens. I have done what I deemed best for humanity. It is easy to protect the interests of the rich and powerful. But it is a great labor to protect the interests of the poor and the downtrodden. These are the words of Thaddeus Stevens, who changed the foundation of our country. 
He defended public schools and helped to found two colleges in Lancaster and Gettysburg. A fierce foe of slavery, he pre pressured Lincoln to free the slaves and help pass constitutional amendments which abolished slavery and laid the groundwork for our equal society. I wish I were the owner of every Southern slave, that I might cast off the shackles from their limbs and witness the rapture which would excite them in the first dance of their freedom. Born into poverty, Stevens was cursed with a club foot, but blessed with a strong-willed mother who believed in education. After graduating from Dartmouth, he moved to Pennsylvania and became a member of the state legislature, where he saved the one-year-old public school system with an impassioned speech that earned him the title of the savior of public education in Pennsylvania. Build not your monuments of brass or marble, but make them of ever-living mind. Elected to Congress in 1848, he was immediately recognized as a foe of slavery. Quote, our enemy has a general now, said one Southern congressman. In 1851, he helped acquit a group of people who resisted the capture of escaped slaves in Christiana, Pennsylvania. There can be no fanatics in the cause of genuine liberty. There may, and every hour shows around me, fanatics in the cause of false liberty, that infamous liberty which justifies human bondage, that liberty whose cornerstone is slavery. But there can be no fanaticism, however high the enthusiasm in the cause of rational, universal liberty, the liberty of the Declaration of Independence. The most powerful congressman during and after the Civil War he helped pass the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, abolishing slavery, and was one of the framers of the 14th Amendment, establishing equal treatment for all. He kept Southerners from taking over Congress and laid the groundwork for Reconstruction, which sought to create an equal biracial society in the South. In 1868, he unsuccessfully tried to remove President Andrew Johnson, who opposed Reconstruction. Stevens is buried in an integrated cemetery here where his epitaph reads, I, re I repose in this quiet and secluded spot, not from any natural preference for solitude, but finding other cemeteries limited as to race by charter rules. I have chosen this that I might illustrate in my death the principles which I advocated through a long life, equality of man before his creator. But, um, <laughs> now, now we'll have uh, the wreath laying, but before uh, we have that, I just want to say, for all your patience and fortitude of uh, sitting this all out, you will be rewarded with a little commemorative booklet and coin of the 14th Amendment. We'll be probably lining up over here right after we have the wreath laid. Have we enough to go around? I think so. <laughs> I hope so. This is a huge, wonderful turnout. Thank so you for sorry. coming. Oh, so this is the wreath leg.
Do you want to start handing? No, do you want to start handing? Cut this off.